Thank you for coming on this snowy day. Um, let me give a couple of brief uh, overview items about uh, the academic forum in general. Uh, we've been doing this now for a year and a half. In fact, a year ago this time, we did just about a week uh, in, 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 with the, in difference, uh, the first of the academic forums, which was on Article 24. Uh, September of this year, we did one on benefits. Uh, October, we did one on political action. November, we did one on post-election review. And then on Dece December, we did one on tenure. Uh, this is the February event you're at. And in March, we have one upcoming on state appropriations, how, how Lansing um, de decides uh, what kind of money we get at Wayne State. So we'll have people here from the House Committee on Appropriations and, and Education. Uh, and then in April, we're looking at one on online teaching. Um, last year, we began this winter of 2014. We had the first one on Article 24. We had one on intellectual property. And we had one on tenure as well. So uh, we are active with, with academic forums. For us, it's a, for the union, it's a means for faculty to have a place to discuss issues, uh, faculty and staff to discuss issues relevant to our life at Wayne State. And also a chance, uh, depending on the panel, to have a say in, in, in some of the decisions that affect uh, us as faculty and staff. Um, the forum is organized by the Council of Representatives of the AAPAFT, and the chair of the council is Kristen Chinnery, who's there, uh, Kristen, who was instrumental in organizing this. If your unit doesn't have uh, someone on the council, uh, consider uh, talking with uh, Kristen and seeing if uh, someone can join the council. That's where we discuss issues across the university, across Wayne Um And then, of course, the panel's greatly helped by Michelle uh, as the attendee for to the AEPFT Association. So, with that said, um, let's talk about this panel. Uh, let me, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Michelle Fecto and, and uh, John Vanderweg, and I'll introduce them uh, both to you, uh, and, then, and then we'll get on with the panel. Um, John Vanderweg is Associate Provost for Academic Personnel at Wayne State. He received his bachelor's and master's in music and PhD in music theory from the University of Michigan. Before joining Wayne State faculty in 2001, he taught music theory and percussion at Douglas College of Rutgers, the state university of New Jersey music theory at the University of Michigan, at DePaul University, and the University of Texas at San Antonio. His work, Serial Music and Serialism, a Research and Information Guide, was published by Rutledge in 2001. He is a visiting evaluator for the National Association of Schools of Music, NASM, and was elected to the NASM Commission on Accreditation in 2012. His Previous administrative positions have included Associate Dean for the Wayne State University College of Fine Performing and Communication Arts, Assistant Dean for Undergraduate Studies in the University of Michigan School of Music, Director of the DePaul University School of Music at Greencastle, Indiana, Assistant Director of the Division of Music at the University of Texas at San Antonio, and Associate Dean for Graduate Studies and Research in UTSA's College of Fine Arts and Humanities. John, thank you for joining us. Michelle Fecto, um, since 2007, has served as the Executive Director of the AAPAFT Local 6075 at Wayne State University uh, Local. She is also a member of the Michigan State Board of Education, elected in 2012. She serves as the Board Delegate to the National Association of State Boards of Education and is a member of the State Task Force on Discipline and School Finance. From 96 to 2007, Ms. Fecto was a member of the AUPAFT and served on the union's executive board. She was employed as a labor educator in Wayne State's Labor Studies Center. And before coming to Wayne State, Michelle worked as a union and community organizer with the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, Local 951 in Michigan, the International Ladies' Garment Workers Union at their international offices in New York City, the Service Employees International Union, Local 739 in Detroit, and the Association for Community Organizations for Reform Now, ACOR, in Chicago. She served, she received her formal education from Michigan State with degrees in employment relations and political science and her master's in labor and industrial relations. Michelle is also a foster and adopted parent and the mother of seven, including one child with autism, which has led her to her activism on behalf of people with disabilities. Michelle, thank you for joining sure. us. Um, so, to begin, um, and I'm Haigo Shagan uh, from the Department of Communications, uh, and we'll 
moderate uh, today's discussion. The way we do the forums is um, we ask each panelist to give uh, the introductory a few minutes of, of comments on the topic. Then we'll discuss issues relevant to the to the panel's topic, and then we'll open it up to questions from the uh, from the floor. So, with that said, um, John, you want to uh, make an opening <laughs> statement? Well, uh, gosh, thank you for coming and for the invitation to talk with you today. This is actually my second session in about two weeks on selective salary issues. Uh, I met with a very large number of the staff members of the AUP uh, through their ASSC mm -hmm. about two weeks ago, and they had a lot of good questions. Um, <clears throat> as you are aware, we are still in the early years of what I refer to as the eternal contract, um, which lasts until 2021. And this contract had a couple of new provisions with respect to selective salary. We also, for the staff side, entered into a letter of agreement last year that clarified the procedures to be used in those units that really, and these are the larger sort of college, school college and divisional units that didn't have enough tenured or um, ESS staff to provide for a contractual um, staff salary committee at the school college division level. So we made a letter of agreement. Uh, Ricardo, Barbara, Charlie, and Michelle and I worked quite hard to find the final language for that. Um, I think we have provided a workable and working system now for those units that don't have a large number of ESS or tenured academic staff. The big change that I have tried to remind people about in the current contract is that participation in the selective salary review for both staff and faculty is no longer an optional activity. It is required. It's required under the contract. There are some sanctions that exist under the contract if people do not participate. Um, the sanctions on the faculty side are probably a little bit more severe than they are on the staff side in that there are kinds of things that will happen if you do not participate, for example, this year and you're a faculty member. That means you will forego the selective salary increase, of course, because you didn't participate, couldn't be evaluated. You will also leave, uh, lose two semesters worth of sabbatical credit teaching credit towards sabbatical. So if you're a faculty member and you don't participate this year and you were going to apply for a sabbatical next year in your eighth term of eligibility, you would have only six terms of eligibility and you wouldn't be eligible for a sabbatical. Um, and also on the faculty side, no departmental or university travel funds can, will be made available. Um, with that said, we have instituted administratively a tracking system so that as the scores for selective salary and salary increases are entered into the mass salary system, it allows me to go back and find out who did not participate in any one academic year or fiscal year. Um, I will use that data to check because on <clears throat> both sides of the house, if you do not participate two times in any five-year period, you also will not receive the across-the-board increase. So that's a, and that's a very real thing. There were, I won't identify where they were, there were 18 individuals who did not receive their across-the-board increase last August because for the first two years of the contract, they had not participated in selective salary reviews. That is a contractual provision. Um, so please be aware. Also understand that we have built into the selective salary scoring system the ability to say someone participated but really didn't give us enough information to have a meaningful evaluation. It means you responded and you provided information. You may not have provided enough or the right kind of information. 
Those individuals will receive zeros in the appropriate categories. If you don't participate, it gets recorded as a DMP, did not participate. So we've tried to build some safeguards into the system. We have some senior faculty, even some senior staff, who say, you know, I don't want to take any money out of the limited selective salary pool, so I don't really want to be evaluated. Even that statement is enough to say that you've participated in the process. So uh, that would take you out of the, the sanctions. Um, and we certainly understand that. I think other staff and faculty in those units appreciate it. Um, so those are the, the important, they're not changes anymore, but the important things to remind people about, that there are sanctions if you do not participate, and participation is not voluntary, it's required under the contract. Primarily for both faculty and staff, you submit the same things, an updated professional record to your department chair or supervisor, a statement, and this sometimes causes some problems with the wording of, because in both the guidelines document and in the, in the contract, it uses the word presentation. But a statement of your last three years of uh, activities in the appropriate areas for staff, we look at job performance, professional achievement, and service. For faculty, we look at teaching, research, scholarly creative activities, and service. And there are different proportions for the two groups. Um, for both groups, the selective salary pool is established usually by uh, our budget officer, Celeste Lejeune, in early June. You're to be considered, people need to be on faculty or staff on May 15th with the expectation that they will be here on August 19th, the following August. So you have to be here on the last day of university year appointments, and we anticipate that you will be here on the first day of the next year. What we do then is add up everybody's total salaries, and it's a simple multiplication of 1.25%. That then is identified through school college division units and then the uh, staff and faculty salary committees consult with the dean on how those funds will be allocated out. There's no stated common practice. There are various common practices that have been established over time in the various units, but there is nothing in the contract other than the division of funds among staff is four-sevenths for job performance, two-sevenths for achievement, and one-seventh for service. For the faculty side, it's three-sevenths for teaching, three-sevenths for research, creative, scholarly work, and one-seventh for service. So that's a real general <laughs> overview. I'll um, also remind you that the provost's office annually issues guidelines and a cover memo that discuss the evaluation process and the deadlines. These are posted on our website under academic resources, and then you'll see a list of things, and the bottom thing is selective salary. If you click on that link, you'll find the memo and the guidelines for both faculty side and staff side. And you can download those to your heart's content. I know that Tammy and the AUP have provided a link to that site. Um, and all of the materials were updated as of late January. I don't anticipate any changes. Take a look at the website. A um, couple of things I just want to add, because John gave a really thorough explanation. Um, when we were bargaining over this language, um, <clears throat> there, it, was, it was really difficult, and it, was, it took up a lot of our time. Um, most of the time was dedicated to this. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you remember, there was an initial uh, proposal to um, make it a lot easier to detenure or uh, folks. And um, 
and that was not palatable um, to us. But you know, we we understood that there was a uh, there was uh, the perception that there, there needed to be some sort of review because um, to help folks that maybe were here but weren't producing um, or weren't you know doing all the work that they needed to do. So we conceded that maybe there needed to be an opportunity to review. Um, but we always, and we all agreed on, that it would be um, with the um, intention of helping that person um, develop and have the resources that they needed to uh, meet the expectations of their department and that it would involve peer review and that that person would also have a voice in, in what happened. So that's uh, another part of Article 24 to speaks to a mentoring committee. And, um, uh, and I think there's a lot of, um, you know, the, a lot of discussion was on about that um, and whether that was a good or bad thing. But I want to say that the, the Board of Governors statutes for both academic staff and faculty and the protections that are in that were not changed. So the protections for tenure in ESS are still there. What was added was another layer where if the committee, the Selective Salary Committee, which is made up of uh, people in your department or your division in college, if you're uh, academic staff, um, and, and an administrator, a chair, a director, all of those people on that committee have an equal vote, right? So they review, and if there's a substantial, not just, you know, a dip in your, <laughs> or one year of a low score, but if there's been a substantial and prolonged sort of um, uh, low scores in selective salary as decided by your uh, committee, the committee may, doesn't have to, may recommend mentoring. And the mentoring um, process, and it, it has to be in, for academic staff, it's in job performance. Mm -hmm. And for, um, uh, faculty, it's uh, it's for the teaching and research. It's not service. So um, then the recommendation is made, and um, and also something is that the committee, if there are things that uh, can make recommendations in writing about what could be done to to improve. So next year, the person has some direction about what is expected, and I think that that's fair. So if if they do decide to go to a mentoring committee. The, um, the committee itself gets to appoint a mentor, the um, chair, dean, director gets to appoint a mentor, and the person themselves gets to appoint a mentor. And then they, that person themselves is also part of a team that looks at what can be done. And sometimes, you know, we, we had a case where, uh, it was in the School of Medicine, where a woman, uh, re, uh, one of our members, was below on research, and one of the issues is that she didn't have a lab. <laughs> to do the work he needed to do, and and so there were there were there were a variety of concerns, but sometimes it's a the committee can identify structural things that are in the in the way, and there's money that's been set aside by the provost's office, um, seventy five thousand for faculty, twenty five thousand for academic staff. We have you know three times more faculty than academic staff in the unit that can that the committee can tap into for training for support for whatever to help that person succeed so the idea is is that this committee and that they have to be given at least a year to sort of work out a plan and uh, and help that person meet the expectations of the department so the it's not to be punitive it's not to be um, uh, it's it's the idea it's not to try to you know, uh, first step for detenuring. It's the idea is that it's to help support um, and get people all working, you know, at, at the best level that they can. So I think um, uh, that's me. For academic staff, there, there were, you know, Ar Article 24 also speaks to workload. And so does it, it for faculty. So sometimes when somebody says, you know, I keep getting more and more and more and more work and nothing's being taken away. Um, there are things in Article 24 that allow you to address workload and if the workload is fair. So, um, and, and a re review process for academic staff on how to do that. So, um, I guess that's about all I want to say at this point and just Thank allow you, people to ask questions. Ask. I just remembered one other change. <laughs> yeah. Because we did a September letter of agreement with respect to the faculty issues. 
um, <clears throat> somehow there had been a mismatch, a long-standing mismatch, um, at least back to 2001 when I first came to Wayne State, that said for faculty selective salary reviews, we would look at a three-year window for um, research, uh, creative activities, uh, scholarly activity, service, but only a one-year window for set scores. And a number of departments have questioned this over the years. And finally, um, I don't know whether Charlie asked me or I said to Charlie, well, why don't we just do a letter of agreement? It seems to me that everyone understands that we need, we're looking at a three-year period for a particular reason. That is so that it captures and uh, it has sort of an evening effect of the data over a three-year period. So that, especially with respect to set scores, perhaps someone has been on sabbatical for a semester. They would only have one semester's worth of set scores that year. And they're being evaluated against, uh, not really against, but in the same pool as people with a full year of set scores. By expanding that uh, time frame to three years, it evens out those kinds of differences and it also allows for and I've, I've been a classroom teacher um, since I've been a classroom teacher for more than 40 years um, every once in a while you run into a mean class a nasty class they don't like and it really doesn't matter you could have Bozo the clown up there handing out free food every day they don't like it and you're gonna get bad set scores. It happens. So again, by looking at a longer period, it evens out those variances and allows the salary committees to, I think, have a more nuanced view of uh, the student evaluations. Yeah. And, and, and teaching should not be just the set scores. I mean, we're, we've got this language that talks about um, uh, peer review of of everything, so we should also consider and review the. Uh, we have to be careful about that one. Okay. <laughs> Why? Um, the two end committee that laid out the guidelines for peer evaluation of teaching specifically said that it would be for formative reviews only, which means that it is only to assist the teacher in improving their classroom teaching skills, approach, things like right. that. But still. It is, a and it's, the results of those reviews will not be shared with department chairs, will not be shared with salary committees or promotion and tenure committees, right. unless the person receiving the review mm -hmm. wants to include it in those okay. materials. Yeah, thanks for the it is voluntary on the part of the person being reviewed. Yeah. But maybe you should clarify this for me and everyone else, because my understanding is that when it comes to the teaching evaluation, that um, not you, the, the even you know so the, the peer review is one thing, but the review should not simply be That's looking correct. at the set scores. Typically, and in I'll talk about it in the context of the department that I chaired. Typically, we ask for as part of that annual report my faculty came to call it their five greatest hits list so that in each of the three areas that people were being evaluated mm -hmm. they discussed in their own words here are my uh, primary accomplishments right. in teaching in research in service and we also said if you have revised a course significantly make sure you list that if you're doing five master's student theses this semester or this year. Make sure you list that. A new class. Um, a, new class. a new class. Developed a new class. Um, you may submit syllabi if you wish. So uh, the department accepted a lot of kinds of information. Mm -hmm. It did not simply look at set scores. Mm -hmm. John, do you want to talk specifically about Article 24? Uh, you talked about selective salary. No, uh, other than uh, it's important to understand that that particular process is driven by the faculty and staff salary committees. And so if in their opinion, 
an individual is not <clears throat> performing at the level of the norms and standards of the department or unit. And those norms and standards are typically defined by each unit's factors. Um, there is some language in the guidelines documents. Among them, it helps people understand. I'll, I'll just go to the faculty guidelines. But it helps people understand both the types of things that should be reviewed and what the evaluation levels mean. Um, and so <clears throat> for scholarship, creative activity, and, and research, if one is ranked at group three as associate or full professor, they may be maining, maintaining a program of scholarly or creative activity that would not be high enough to qualify and or large enough in amount to warrant promotion to their current rank. It's a fairly straightforward. For those placed in group three, the faculty salary or staff salary for job performance only may, they don't, they really should, but I, sitting in the provost's office, I can't control all the <laughs> faculty yeah. salary committees. They should offer suggestions for improvement when they determine that group three ranking. For group four, Michelle is correct. That is defined as performing substantially below the unit's factors and norms. The salary committee may recommend a peer mentoring committee. It doesn't have to, but it may. If it does recommend one, that sort of puts it into, okay, there will be a peer mentoring committee. Everybody participates as noted in the contract in forming it in working through the process, the next year's salary committee asks that peer mentoring committee for a report mm -hmm. in time to be considered during the next year's selective salary. There are a number of options that may obtain out of that report, but it is up to the next year's selective salary committee to determine whether the plan has been worked through, it has been successful, will disband the committee. They may make a suggestion that it continue for another year. They may make other kinds of suggestions. But again, this is all driven by the elected faculty and or staff salary committees. Yes? I'm I have not been aware of that happening. It shouldn't happen. Um, the question was, what happens if the, the <coughs> salary committee makes a recommendation, but it's not formed? Then, you know, my understanding is that the um, the administrator should be make it should be made known to that administrator that a committee needs to be formed, and um, working, you know, like and then then that person, you know, gets the ball rolling saying, you know, okay, this is what needs to happen, you know, you pick a, a person, which, you know, the committee picks the person, they select the person, um, and sort of um, organizes the convening of that committee. So I think if the, if it doesn't, ha if, the, if the administrator has been notified and then the committee is not convened, then um, it, it, that would drop to the administrator who should it be um, now, you know, you expect there to be some communication between the committee, like what's going on, maybe it's a busy time and they were, but. They, they were able to sort of pull the committee. Okay, so they were aware and reminded. And yeah, I happened. think you need to let Michelle know the details of that so I can check into it. Um, I'm aware on the faculty side of uh, at least one mentoring committee that was held over for a second year and uh, you know a revised plan was was worked out I don't think that that committee has reported yet um, I'm also aware again on the faculty side I haven't been 
so aware on the staff side of even committees being recommended. That's not true. There was one that I was aware of, uh, but because of other circumstances, yeah. um, the committee was disbanded. Um, so, again, we're, we're sort of early on in this particular change in the contract. Um, but again, if, to speak to your s specific first question, if a salary committee has recommended to the program director, chair, whoever the supervisor is, that a mentoring committee be formed and that committee is not formed, and you are aware of it, whether you're the object or whether you are a member of the, of the committee, you need to let Michelle know so that I can go back and check and find out what's going on. John, the entire process is uh, initiated and, and driven and concluded by the uh, selected salary committee. That's right. Uh, and based on the report by the uh, mentoring committee. Mm -hmm. um, the salary committee is not bound, is it bound to accept the reports? It can. Um, the chair is the um, the chair or program director or whatever is the chair of the salary committee with a vote. Okay. Um, oh, just one vote. One, they only don't, one. They don't get to only veto one. the committee. Yeah. They have one vote right. among many. It's, it's one vote. Um, and that is not defined in the contract. It seems to me that a salary committee can say you haven't given us to the peer mentoring committee. You haven't given us enough information. or we agree with your conclusions, or we want, uh, we need further discussion. Uh, it's simply not defined in the contract, and I think that that's an issue that needs to be worked out where the peer mentoring committee exists, yeah. working cooperatively with the salary committee. So you as, as the social provost are aware of the cases in the system. Not always. Uh, no. Doesn't. And unless like, it's not unless the there's some issue. Yeah, yeah. and it's a, for clarification or support. And you know, I've, there's a case that I'm aware of that I thought it was very interesting. A faculty member who felt that they were going to go up, that they could see it in the stars, um, in formed his own informal committee, and he chose his own mentors um, to help him, um, and to so you know to try to you know not have to do the formal. And he had more control over it. He picked people that he trusted and respected. Um, and the feed, then he's been getting some real um, concrete feedback and good feedback on it. And um, so it's, it's sort of, it's interesting to me. But I mean, I think it's, I think what I like about the mentoring committee is that the individual gets to pick somebody on that committee and they are a part of that committee. And um, to make sure, I mean, that for the union side, you know, our fear is to make sure that somebody is not being railroaded or that, that you know, there's a, a, a chair or a director that just has a, a bone to pick with somebody about, you know what I mean, and to make sure that so it's balanced so let me and fair. Let ask this about the process, and I don't think this is in the language either. And it's early in the process overall, so you, may, you mentioned the figures yourself, but suppose someone is placed under uh, some, as a result of Article 24, increased teaching load. How does one get out of that? That's a good question. Well, <laughs> <coughs> it is undefined yeah. in the contract. However, if, and I'll just, I'll make an example of myself. So I'm, I'm placed that way. I was in a department that had a normal 3-2 teaching load. So I have a 3-3 teaching load. I don't like that. I want to get out from under it. What's my option? Well, I was placed on increased teaching load because my creative research work wasn't judged to be sufficient. So I can do creative research work and prove to the salary committee over a course of a year or two that I don't, I no longer would be rated group three or four in creative research work. How would you affect the process? So it's not a, another mentoring committee. You think a formal letter, maybe to the salary committee, or how sure. does the process work? Do you think? Well, I mean, you do an annual report, 
that the salary committee reviews. Mm -hmm. Creative um, research. You highlight the research creatively. Something along those lines. Right? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. so that you would ask them to formally reconsider the, the, sure. the conditions. And yeah. And and the seventy five thousand dollars that which which seems which is a great idea um, that resides in your office. How does that how does that access? Has anyone asked for it? How do you? Nobody has asked for it. Yeah. In the last two years. So I, you know, I would encourage. I mean, I made the statement last year that you, you all are leaving money on the table here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, all, really, that is necessary, is a proposal either coming from a peer mentoring committee, an individual and chair, and now I'm not saying that the chair needs to approve the mm -hmm. proposal; they need to be aware of the proposal. So. Uh, an individual and chair. Um, understand if I get a proposal from an individual faculty or staff member that ha doesn't, is not apparent to me that anybody else has been involved in it, I'm probably going to send it back to the chair and see if the salary committee and, and the chair agree that this is a, a worthwhile or that this is a good way to address some of the issues. You expect the salary committee or the mentoring committee to either sign on? either, either. Okay. yeah, or the chair. I mean, it's not. Oh, it's really <coughs> not restrictive in the sense that it can only be people who are currently undergoing Article Twenty Four peer mentoring. Yeah. Oh. It is not. Oh. Good to know. Very good question. <laughs> any other questions? <laughs> or yeah, uh, any other questions? On, uh, Mm -hmm. for the afternoon staff. Okay. Under our rules that um, academic staff evaluation takes place. Okay. No, no, this is only a selective salary ranking. And the primarily, uh, I don't even know how, how the numerical ranking system evolved. Ricardo? Yeah, I have one. The, the, the thing that reflects things that happen in salary also results in ranks one, two, three, and four. Isn't that what you're saying? Two things that can be created. You can have the top of one of these ranks. It doesn't matter if they're below rank one, two, three. Yes. Yeah. One, uh, another way to think of it is uh, both the faculty factors, staff factors, talk about excellence and achieving excellence in job performance, in um, professional achievement in service. Um, a one really means that a person is achieving and demonstrating a very high degree of performance in those areas. There are gradations that are allowed in the system. The, uh, salary committees can do 1, 1 1.5, 2, 2.5, 3, 3.5, 4. 
for job performance, but the other two categories for staff are limited to one through three. So again, there are gradations. And also, it is important to note that selective salary evaluations and reviews are separate from the annual evaluation for tenure track faculty and ESS or tenure track staff. So that those annual evaluations should also be issued by the appropriate departmental committee and supervisor or administrator to help the folks who are on tenure track or ESS track understand where their performance is at that time. And most chairs, most good chairs, will assist the person undergoing the annual evaluation by helping them understand that you're making progress, you're making good progress, you're making excellent progress toward the achievement of ESS. I, John, I had a, I'm just gonna, because the, the question has come up. So you said it's ESS track or tenure track, but the contract says non-tenured. Uh, uh, it also so, includes, So yes. lecturers are included yes. in that, and uh, you know, people on subsidies are not necessarily. Right. Okay. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, uh, here's my take, Ricardo, and I think you'll understand where I'm coming from. I'll consider any proposal. I'll probably come back to, um, on the staff side, you and Barbara and Charlie, on the faculty side, to Rita and Bob and, and Charlie, to see if we believe this is an, a reasonable use of the funds. Understand, too, that unlike other um, budgetary categories, this is $75,000 per year. It doesn't roll forward. If it's not used, my <clears throat> sometime friend Rob Corman sucks it up into the end of the year um, budget accounts, right? Yeah. So I really, I'd much, I'd much prefer to receive proposals that then we can uh, cooperatively look at. They are included in the represented faculty for selective salary. So for this uh, funding that the library and staff were both eligible, are they also eligible? It's not sabbaticals, but it is. it can be used for conference attendance or um, things that will improve job skills. Well, and I, th I do think, well, I do think that a lot of that is unit-based, um, 
and as budgetary pressures have been applied uh, over the last 15 years that some funding that may have been available at one time uh, has had to be redirected. But again, I, I'll go back to my initial statement. I would rather see proposals for the use of the funds that I can discuss with the AUP rather than not have any proposals. And I think there's a difference, too, because, you know, it's not coming out of the department's budget. So your right. chair may be more inclined to support this funding that's coming from the provost's but, but uh, office. But these funds aren't figured by uh, pension committee members. These are no. funds for development. Yeah, What's for the heading? Is it development funds? Or is it? It's professional development. Professional yeah. development funds. Yeah. yeah. I thought it was triggered by that. Uh, no. oh. Well, it's cited in Article It's in Article 24, yeah. Article 24 yeah. but it's been there for years. Right. Uh, Uh, the professional development funds are administered out of the provost's office. So there should be a direct uh, aid to the provost's office. Well, the proposal needs to end up on my desk somehow. But well, you mentioned earlier that it should copy the chair or the, the you director. Have a chair who, uh, you do it to the chair, and the chair doesn't forward it to you. <laughs> well, then send it to me, and I'll get I'll yeah. go rattle the chair's exactly. chain. Yeah, it, it, and Charlie, he mentioned before that. Um, that you would write to the provost's office and you could copy uh, the chair. Yeah. 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 Any questions? Any others? Cl closing comments by uh, Council Chair? No. Um, I thought the questions were really good. If you have any um, need for support or um, things aren't quite going the way you think they should, um, when uh, when you when you come time to do your selected salary, you know. Contact the union office, uh, Ricardo, Barbara, Charlie, Rita. We've got a whole bunch of folks to help you. And um, and I have to say, we've been working uh, really well with the provost office and getting a lot of things resolved in an amicable way. So um, anyway, uh, uh, I look forward to this running smoothly um, this year. Well, with that then, thank you everyone for coming. And thank you, uh, John, sure. Michelle, for joining us. Sure. Thank you.